Beginning Church and our online family and friends, thank you so much for joining us on today. Our scripture will come from Revelation, the 11th chapter, in the 17th verse. Revelation, the 11th chapter, in the 17th verse. And it reads, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come because you have taken your great power and reigned. I must read that again. Verse 17 says, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come because you have taken your great power and reigned. And our song for today is Our God is an Awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an in the name of Jesus the Christ we come Lord God we honor you tonight for you are worthy of all the praise all the honor and all the glory God we thank you Lord for another privilege another chance a great opportunity to come before you Lord we thank you Father God that you are holy and we are not worthy but you allow us to come into your presence Lord we thank you Father God that you reign that you are in control that you rule and super rule now, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins, forgive us for messing up. Now, Lord, we ask you, Father God, to bless us through your word, your word to be made clear, your word, Father God, that will be a blessing to us. It's in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Yeah, the God we serve, he yet reigns. And he is the awesome hallelujah he is he is the awesome god and he does he does reign for tonight we're looking at exodus chapter 14 exodus chapter 14 the, the larger the larger part of this chapter is where we'll be landing tonight exodus chapter 14 i have a little red book called Red Sea Rules, Red Sea Rules. We'll be looking at that from time to time. And we'll take excerpts tonight from the book by Robert Morgan, Robert J. Morgan called Red Sea Rules. 
he, he suggests that there are, there are some rules that you need to be conscious of when you're going through your Red Sea experiences. He says that there are some rules that we need to abide by. There are some rules that we need to adhere to when we're going through our experiences. As we close out the year, some of us realize that uh, we are in, in front of a Red Sea. Some of us realize that the Red Sea is blocking us from Canaan land. Some of us realize that the Red Sea is impeding our progress. So Robert Morgan talked about there are certain rules that you ought to have when you face your Red Sea experiences. Let's look at Exodus, Exodus chapter 14. I'm going to read verses 26 through 31, but the entire chapter is where we will, we will put our focus on tonight. Exodus chapter 14, verses 26 through 31. Exodus 14, 26 through 31. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not much, not much, not so much as one of them remain. But the children of Israel had walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea, and the waters were, wall, were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians die on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. I want to talk about three things tonight. When we come to our Red Seas, there are calamities, there are complexities, and there are conclusions. There are calamities, there are complexities, and there are conclusions. What is Red Sea? What is the Red Sea? And tonight I hope we can have a dialogue instead of a lecture. Uh, what, what, what do you think about when you talk about a Red Sea? What, what is a Red Sea in your life? What do we mean when we talk about we've come to our Red Seas? Anybody? Yes, sir. Something you can't cross on your own. Something you can't go across on your own. Anybody else? Red. Red. Red as far as just red as far as not evil, but problems. Problems. Okay, problems. Anybody else? Red Sea. Anybody? It's an obstacle that keeps us from moving forward. Problems, obstacles, something that impedes progress, impedes progress. Something that hinders us. Anybody else? And this hindrance is, is hindering us from going somewhere, and usually somewhere we want to go. <laughs> something we want to do, something we want to happen. Anybody at a Red Sea right now? Anybody? Anybody at a point where you'd rather not be? 
She says she's been there, but she's good now. Anybody in the Red Sea right now? Anybody? Anybody is struggling with anything right now? Going through anything? I am. I am? Yes, I am. So we're, we're at this point, and see, we all have problems daily, right? But when you get to a Red Sea, it's a show enough problem. It's an issue. I mean, it's an all-out stone gas, honey. Most of us in that room heard that before. It's an all-out blowout. It's an all-out problem. Robert Morgan suggests, as well as uh, Moses suggests in the book of Exodus, that we will all have our Red Seas in life. Sometimes the sea is bigger, sometimes the sea is smaller. But somebody said that a Red Sea is something that you can't go over by yourself. So if you can't go over by yourself, how are you going to get there? How are you going to get over if you can't make it by yourself? How are you going to do it? Anybody? It takes the Lord to get you there, right? So if it takes the Lord, then we need to take the Lord with us before we get to our Red Seas. The first thing I see is calamities. The first thing, there are some calamities. And of course, Robert Morgan writes his version. I write my version. I rewrite it the way I want to. I just give him credit for the book. The first thing I see under calamities is there are re there's a Red Sea in front of us. There, the Red Sea is in front of us. We're trying to go forward, but the Red Sea is there. Matter of fact, it gets to a point where Moses is standing before the people. He's already been complaining to God about them. These, these knuckleheads just won't do what I ask them to do. They won't do what you ask them to do, God. So three things happen at the Red Sea that, uh, that will bless us tonight. First of all, there are calamities. The first calamity is there's a Red Sea in front of us. The second calamity is there are enemies behind us. And they, close, they are close behind us. These enemies are on our trail. They are not a mile behind us. They right where we can see the dust of their chariots. It's a Red Sea experience. The old folks said that. The hellhounds are on my trail. So, so they're they looking at a Red Sea in front of them. They're looking at the enemy, Pharaoh, the Egyptians' army behind them. And they're looking at mountains and desert all around them. I'm telling you, these are calamities here, brother. These are, this is showing sure enough something going on here. We can't go forward because the sea is in front of us. We can't go backward because the enemy that we're trying to escape is behind us. And we can't escape to the left or the right because guess what? There are mountains there and there's a desert there. We're in a fix. We have calamities. Question, how did we get here? When you're in the midst of your calamities, when you're in the midst of a Red Sea experience, you want to ask yourself a question. How in the world did I end up here? Have you ever been there? I've been at a point in my life where I said, man, how did I end up here? <laughs> because trouble can come up on you so fast, you don't even know how you got there. You didn't drive into it. You didn't walk into it. You didn't intentionally get into it. So your first question becomes, how did I get here? Have you ever gone somewhere and realized that you're at the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people doing the wrong thing? You said, now, I was raised better than this. Now, how did I get here? I confess. <laughs> how in the world did I get here? You look around you and no one looks like you. No one acts like you. No one was reared like you. And you wonder, how in the world did I end up here? Second question. Is it my fault? Is it my fault that I'm here? Did I do something? Did I think something? Did I act something that landed me here? First question is, how did I get here? Second question is, is it my fault? 
Did I deliver myself to this? <laughs> if you got a Red Sea, sometimes it's not your fault. And as we move forward, we understand God will situate you somewhere in the midst of your Red Sea or on the, in front of your Red Sea. God will do it. Isn't that a shame? He's supposed to be good. He's supposed to be loving. He's supposed to be kind. He said he was going to look out for me. He said he would never leave me nor forsake me. And how did I end up here with the God I serve? Am I making sense? Am I asking good questions? How did I, how did I end up here? And the third question on the calamity is this is the third question. How can I get out? How can I get out? There was a time when Deshaun Watson saw things falling apart around him. He played that song. It wasn't a Christian song either, y'all. So it didn't, it didn't have Christian lyrics. He said, how am I going to get it? This is the, the revived Christian version of it. How am I going to get out of this place alive? It's like 23 women, 26 women, 30 women, 31 women. How in the world did I get here? Is it my fault? And how am I going to get out? One thing about Deshaun is he got paid to get out. Most of the time, we don't get paid to get out. We don't, wait. We don't make millions to get out. So the question is, how did I get here? Is it my fault? But the big question is, how am I going to get out? I mean, I've been in a fix before, and I wonder, Lord, how am I going to get out? I don't know if I told you all the story. Um, I was riding with Robert Taylor. That's him. He's at fault. Riding with Robert Taylor, we pull up to Johnny Mac gas station. We, we go to get gas, and a guy jumps out of his car with a pistol, with a revolver. We must be about 17, 18 years old. The guy jumps out. Never seen the guy before. Didn't, you know, we're in a little small town. I don't know everybody. But he was so much older, I didn't know who he was. He jumps out the car with a revolver, and he, he points it at the two of us, and then he puts it up to my head. My, my. Let me tell you. God is good all the time. So he puts it up to my head, and he said, I'm going to blow your brains out because... You all took my sisters and my cousin to the cemetery and left them out there, and it was sneezing and raining. And I'm like, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And this time, I didn't know what he was talking about. This time, I hadn't done anything wrong. So he pulled the trigger. And if you know anything about handguns, revolvers don't jam. He pulled the trigger while it was at my head, and it jammed. It didn't go off. The whole time I'm wondering, how did I get here? <laughs> so after the, the gun jammed, he let us go. We get in the car, we're riding down the road. I said, do you know what he's talking about? He said, yeah, that wasn't you. That was me and my other buddy. And I'm looking at him like, how did I get involved in this? I just got in the car with you. We just ride and listen to Maze and Franklin Beverly. We just ride and listen to Funkadelic. We, we just ride and listen to Parliament. And here I am with a gun up to my head, and I don't know how in the world I got here. Let me tell you, that was my Red Sea experience. Can you see that as my Red Sea? I've had many after that, but that one stands out clearly. Over 40 years ago, that incident stands out very, very clearly in my mind. We ride down the road and say, man, what, what are they talking about? Oh, man, you wasn't with me that night. <laughs> oh. How did I get here? It wasn't even my fault. <laughs> but thank God God got me out. Gun jam. And there is a great testimony. <laughs> Not just for that night, but years later, after I had moved to Houston, man, I had, I had to get out of there alive. 
I, I had to get, it was such a blessing just to drive 600 miles and just leave that, that life behind. Sister Brown, the gun tricker was pulled. And no fire jumped out. No metal jumped out. And I'm still here to talk about it. So years later, now I'm a preacher. I go back to preaching a revival. And there's this guy singing. And I never saw him since then. There's this guy singing in the quartet. The Lord has saved him and saved me. I'm sitting down. I'm ready to appeal to the people my, my convictions of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all I can think about is Brother Nelson up there singing to the Lord. Years later, many years later, he's standing, he's singing to the Lord. And I'm still wondering, years later, how did I get involved? And after the revival, he came to me and said, man, I'm sorry. So I had to state my case. You know I ain't had nothing to do with that, right? <laughs> I had to at least let him know, man, I, I had nothing to do with it. So when we get, our, get to our Red Seas, water in front of us, can't swim, can't drink it. The enemy, enemy behind us. And then this is what God says, and this is what Moses says to the people. God says, get those people across that sea. So Moses says, Stand still. The people said, go back. They started saying crazy stuff like we had land in Egypt to bury our dead, and you shouldn't have messed with us anyway. We were doing just fine before them. That's how some couples live. When the moment something goes wrong, I was doing fine all by myself. Then they started saying crazy stuff like I can do bad all by myself. Women quick to say, I don't need a man anyway. I got all I need. When you're at your Red Sea, you have a tendency to blame somebody else. Fights break out at the Red Sea. Arguments take place at the Red Sea. We were driving home one day, and, and all of a sudden the light goes off, so you got 50 miles to gas. All of a sudden, the sleeping person next to me woke up and said, you didn't get gas last time? I won't tell y'all who that was. <laughs> you telling me last time we stopped, you didn't put any gas in this car? Now we at a Red Sea because the nearest gas station is 70 miles. <laughs> and the indicator says 50 miles. And now I'm about to get jumped on. You tell me you ain't put no gas in this car last time we stopped. I said, well, I was intending to make it to Lake Charles. Well, we ain't going to make it to Lake Charles. But thank God for you totem stores. Y'all know where you totem stores are? Little, little, little corner, mom and pop store side of the road. They had some gas, so we got gas, and we kept moving. The, the, the fact is that people get discouraged. People attack each other when they come to their Red Seas. And the attack doesn't do you any good. Sunday school lesson on Sunday said that we are in a spiritual warfare. We don't fight against each other. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. So you might as well become a united front, stick together and fight together. Because I could have easily said you shouldn't have gone to sleep. Then you would have seen if I had gas or not. Now, I could have said that. But I understand this is a spiritual warfare. It's not a warfare where we can blame each other. The devil wins when we fight. The devil wins when we argue. We got to figure out how we're going to get out of here. So first of all, there are calamities. The Red Sea is in front of us. Enemies are behind us. Mountain and deserts are around us. We ask questions. How did we get here? Is it my fault? Is it our fault? And how do we get out? Second thing I say to you is found in verse number one. God knows where you are. When you go back and read in your leisure, you will find out in Exodus chapter 14, God tells them where to camp. He tells them where to get, get off. 
tells them where to rest. He tells them what sea to, to, to camp out next to. He tells them what mountains to be close to. God situated them right where they were. Isn't that a mess? The God you have, the God you serve, he put you in this. God knows where you are. God tells them where to camp. Tells them where to be. Tells them who to be with. Guess what? God has not forgotten where you are. Matter of fact, God, look at Job. Job going on by his business. He's praying. He's serving the Lord. He's doing things right. He was a rich man, and he was, he was the, a devout follower of God, and he made sure that, that he got in touch with God on a regular basis. He, he prayed for his children, prayed for his wife, and now look at Job. Lost his children, lost his livestock, and really lost his wife. And Job was minding his own business. He was honoring God, and God put, put Job in that position. Did God put you in that position? I'm not saying maybe God put us in this position. The text declares that God put the Israelites in this position. God knowingly, willingly put them, and some people would say recklessly put them in that position. God did it. So what do you do, blame God? There are complexities. The first complexity is you're confused because God put you here. The, the text says, in, in verse number one, the text says that God told him to go there. God told him to stay there. God told him to care. So the first complexity, and these complexities mean I'm confused, God. <laughs> Have you ever been confused with what God is doing? And we talk about praying without ceasing. We talk about fasting and praying. We're talking about giving up stuff for God. We're talking about sacrificing for God. And then God placed us where we are. And it's not a place where we want to be. It's not a pretty place. As far as we're concerned, it's not a healthy place. And as far as we're concerned, it's an uncomfortable place. It's the Red Sea. So I'm complex. I got complexities about why God got me here. And God knowingly put us there. God, when you look at the text, the text says that God placed them there. God told them to go there. The apostle Paul went about preaching and spreading the word. The apostles went about preaching and spreading the word. The Bible said the word, when they, when they started spreading the word, the people tried to kill them, and the word spread it even the more. So when you're working for the Lord, it's not a comfortable thing. If you're comfortable, if you're satisfied, and you're not having any problem, you need to work more. That's why I don't understand the song that says, I've been running for Jesus, and I'm not tired yet. <laughs> Somebody lying. Either they're not running long enough, they're not running hard enough, or they're not running diligently enough. Because when you're running for Jesus, Brother Miles, let me tell you, man, you get tired. You get tired in your spirit, man. Get tired in your emotional person. And you get tired in your physical body. And if you keep messing with church folk, you get tired in your social body. <laughs> I've been, I mean, people rock and they sing and they dance and they shout. I've been running for Jesus and I'm not tired yet. I'm going to tell you, I've been running for Jesus and I get tired all the time. So we have to make sure we watch our motives. Make sure we're running for Jesus for the right reason. Make sure we, we're doing what God has for us to do. Under complex, complexities. Number two, God means for us to be where we are. God means for us to be where we are. We're in a fix, but God means for us to be there. We're in a bad situation, but God, can you see that? See, can you see God putting us there? Can you see God meaning for us to be there? There ought to be some questions, some comments or something right here. 
God means for us to be there. If you don't believe me, look at verse number four. Verse number four says that God promised to harden the heart of Pharaoh. Now, God has done all these great miracles in the presence of Pharaoh. God has convinced Pharaoh to let his people go. After he let him go, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. What does that mean? He hardened his heart. What, what happened? He, he hardened his heart. What does that mean? He hardened Pharaoh's heart. He made Pharaoh embittered. Pharaoh began to wonder, what in the world have I done? All of my, all of my slave labor is gone. He said, well, we better go get those guys. God purposely hardened his heart. God has played. Now, these Israelites are gone. They, millions of them have marched out of Egypt. They're gone. And then God go messing with Pharaoh again. You see, God takes the heart of a man and turn it every which way he wants to. That's why we have to keep our hearts clean. And you don't be surprised on what people say or do because God is in control. And sometimes God will harden a person's heart. So he hardens Pharaoh's heart. And when he hardens Pharaoh's heart, what he does is Pharaoh gets all of his, his chariots, all of his horsemen, all of his, his military forces together, and they go after the Israelites. Look at God again. That's a complexity to me. That's, that's confusing to me. God, I thought you wanted him to let us go. He let us go. Now look what you're doing. And it's not that Pharaoh did it. God did it. God means for us to be where we are. The third thing on the complexities, we must trust God's plan. We must trust God's plan. God has a better plan. God has the best plan. Even when it doesn't look like it, God has the best plan. Look at verse number nine. When, when you look at, at verse number nine, you will see that God has the best plan. God has the best plan. So he causes the Egyptians to pursue them. Now, this is after the Israelites went out with boldness. The Israelite goes out with boldness. God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh, the king of the Egyptians, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. This boldness is about to be shut down. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea. And so guess what, what Pharaoh does? He comes after them. He shows up. Let me tell you, the enemy keeps showing up. See, don't, don't think that when you get with God, life is going to be a bed of roses. Things are going to be over that you had to deal with. Don't think that just because you're with God, Oh, you really got it made. The Egyptians pursued them. Under complexion, there becomes three more questions. How do we remain calm? How do you remain calm with enemies behind you, Red Sea in front of you? How do you remain calm with deserts on each side of you, Mountains you can't climb over. How, can somebody tell me how you remain calm? Well, I guess my question is, do you remain calm? I mean, when your life is on the line. Pink slip from work, do you remain calm? When, when, when bills are due and you got more, more month than money, do you remain calm? When the doctor gives you bad news, do you remain calm? Do you panic? When a loved one passes away, do you remain calm? 
There's so many people in, in every neighborhood in America now saying these words, and you, you can recall these words. I didn't know he would do that. I didn't know she had it in her. So how do you remain calm when a killer is a loose in your neighborhood? Could be in your backyard. Could be in your house. I mean, a sigh of relief goes all over the neighborhood when they say that the killer or the suspect has been apprehended. We got Red Sea experiences. Right now, we got too many young people dying over foolishness. I mean, every single day, too many senior citizens being attacked every single day. And we, we try to believe that we're safe in the church. We want to believe we're safe at home. We used to believe that children were safe at school. But now we spend much of our time praying for schools. And now parents are loving on teachers that they just jumped on last week. Because it's that teacher's responsibility to make sure your child has a locked door and under the right desk. How do we, how do we remain calm? How do we, how do we remain calm at the Red Sea? Next question. How do we trust God in the midst of all this? How do, we, how do we keep trusting God for the same thing? If it's not anything but safety on Houston streets, how do we keep trusting God? You go to a football game, a basketball game, and don't return home. You leave home to go to work, and you got road rage. You stop in front of somebody too quickly, then they get out and start shooting at you. How do we trust God? Or do we do like Joe's wife? Man, give it up. Curse God and die. <laughs> Just give up. Just quit. So how do we trust God? Does anybody know? Can anybody tell me? How, how do you trust God in the midst of this? Or do you? How do you, how do you trust God with all this stuff going on? Stay on bending knees. Anybody else? Prayer. Prayer is the answer. Anybody else? So how do you keep from shaking and losing your mind and having heart attacks? And how do you keep from just losing it? Boy, y'all sound like y'all not keeping from losing it. Y'all sound like y'all about to lose it in here. Anybody? How do you keep from losing it? So iron sharpens iron, right? We support each other. You need, you need a support system. And I know Jesus is all we need, and we say that, right? But you need some Jesus with the flesh on it. Anybody agree? Anybody? Anybody agree? You need Jesus in You need somebody that understands what you're going through. You need somebody who is able to help push you through. You need somebody to sit with you and say nothing but listen. You need a friend whose shoulder you can cry on and they don't judge you. You need Jesus in the flesh. You need the Holy Spirit present in the room. So you got to trust God. Have you ever been to a point, and I want somebody to answer, somebody, I want everybody to answer, have you ever went to the point that you say, this, this God thing just ain't working for me? Yes. Sister Darrington used to sing, sing this song, I Almost Let Go. And she sung it with such great enthusiasm, such great passion. And it was ministering to so many people, right? But it was encouraging us, don't let go. 
it was a testimony that I almost gave up, I almost gave out, I almost quit, I almost let go. And the songwriter said, I almost let go. I was on the edge of a breakthrough and I almost quit. I just want to tell somebody in the room today, you're on the edge of a breakthrough. So don't give up. Don't give out. Don't quit. The literary writer says, when things go wrong as they sometimes will, when the road you're trogging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, when you want to smile but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but whatever you do, don't you quit. Suicide should never be on the table. Giving up should not be a part of your agenda. Hang in there. He's still God. He's still answering prayer. He's still ruling and super ruling. Sister David played this song earlier. It says that he reigns. He rules. You see, we don't, we don't play songs that don't minister to us. We don't sing songs that don't minister. It may not have the beat that you like. But it's the words of the song that ministers to us. It may not be popping and jumping every time, but it's the words of the song that ministers to us. It says, he reigns. And let me tell you, that's enough to keep you focused, just to know that God, we think the governor reigns. We put our hope in the mayor. But the good news tonight is he reigns. He reigns. He reigns. He rules. He has dominion. He's the one we depend on. Stop depending on them, him, and her. Depend on God. He reigns. Next question. When will God see us through? The writer says, weeping May endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Uh, Reverend Leslie Smith preached this, this about back, back in the 90s. He asked the question, how long is the night? <laughs> and some people ask that question at night. You know, Smith is a realist. You know, he's too real sometimes. He's a realist. And he asked the question, Lord, how long is the night? I believe what God says. I heard what God says. I'm trusting what God says. And I know God will keep his promise that weeping will endure for a night. In the morning, joy will come. But Lord, how long is the night? Because you know your faith is tested between the time you ask God and the time God shows up. Your faith is tested from the time you ask God and the time the blessing manifests itself. We're at this Red Sea. And I dare report tonight that everybody that's listening to me, uh, are at, everybody's at that Red Sea. Every single person is at a Red Sea. Some people at a Red Sea that most of us don't even think about. Some people thinking today, how am I going to eat in the morning? Most of us in this room and most of us listening to me, we don't even have that thought. It's not if I'm going to eat, it's what we're going to eat. It's not... When we're going to eat is what time we're going to eat. For, for most of us, it's not if there's going to be something to eat. We know we got something to eat. Children these days decide what they want to eat. When Brother Miles was a boy, he didn't decide what he wanted to eat. I guarantee you, whatever was flopped in front of him, and you better not move until it's all gone. You can go back and get seconds if you want to. And when you get seconds, guess what? You put it on your plate, you get better make it disappear. Children these days have choices. I don't like broccoli. And I ain't eating that spinach either. Every now and then a child during my day would try that and the mom and dad would go to sleep. I ain't eating that. 
Okay. They go to sleep. They go to sleep, wake up in the morning, it's all gone. It's not in the trash. But now we, baby, one, two, three. The question is, when will God see us through? My final thing to you tonight, there must be some conclusions. It must be, when you look at the text, the, the, the Israelites are at the Red Sea. They have enemies behind them. They have natural disasters on each side of them. They got this big body of water. They can't drink. They can't swim. But look at what God does. God opens up this body of water. This body of water becomes a, a sidewalk. It becomes a highway. And the Bible says that the Israelites walk through on dry ground. One step in front of them, they walk through on dry ground. Boy, Miriam couldn't wait to pull out that tamarind. They walked through on dry ground. They didn't get mud on their shoes. 40-year-old shoes, they didn't get mud on them. They walked through a whole body of water on dry ground. That's a miracle to me. On the conclusion, my, my question, do we have to have everything we want right now? Do we have to have what we so anxiously want? Do we have to have it right now? The, uh, the false prognosticators will tell you that you got a blessing by the time you get home. My question would become, why God, you, you say God can do it. Why don't he do it right now? And when you wake up in the morning, you're going to be so blessed. Well, all of us are going to be blessed if we wake up in the morning. <laughs> Y'all ever thought about it? I, you know, I think about things crazy like sometimes, you know. It's like when you wake up in the morning, you're going to have so many blessings. You're right. I start counting them before the morning get there. If the Lord spare me, I wake up. That's one. I put one foot in the front of the other. I got my eyes wide open. I can see my family. I can see my neighbors. Look at what God does. That's why, that's why the late J.R. Richard used to say, uh, God been good to me. Let me count my blessings. And he'll say, he woke me up this morning. Number two, he woke me up this morning. Number three, he woke me up this morning. Because the fact of the matter is, you have a miracle in just being awakened. People went to bed this morning and, and not here. People went to bed last night and through the night they didn't make it. So it's a miracle that God woke us up. So do you really have to have everything you want right now? Do you have to have it right now? Do you, do you just have to have it right now? My next question. Will we be content with God being glorified? When you look at the text, when you look at the text, God says that I am going to be glorified. He says that, that I, he said the Egyptians would know, the Israelites would know that I am God. The Egyptians, the enemy would know that I'm God. The idea is to glorify God. Our lives is to glorify God. Will you be content with God being glorified? Or you just want what you want, when you want it, how you want it, the way you want it. Will you be content with God being glorified? My next question. Will we be willing to suffer for God's sake? Will we, are we willing to suffer for God's sake? Are we? I can tell you about 300 folk are not willing. That I know of the New Beginning Church. Because there's too many empty pews in here. And when we talk about suffering, we want, we're not even wanting to drive five miles. We got cars. We're talking about suffering. We, we drive cars and there's only one person in a six-seater car. We ought to be driving folk here and piling them in here. But that's too much. 
Are we willing to suffer for God's sake as Jesus suffered for our sake? Next question. Will we wait on the Lord? Will we really, really wait on the Lord? We say we wait. We can quote that scripture, can't we? Have you not heard? Have it not been known that the everlasting God, the creator of the universe, <laughs> he sees everything. And then we get to that good part down there where we quote, the, the youth shall give out. But they that wait upon the Lord, we shall renew our strength. Let me just tell you, if you're not doing anything, you don't have any strength that needs to be renewed. We shall renew our strength. We will mount up with wings as eagles. We shall run and folks shouting all over the place. And they ain't done nothing for the Lord in a long time. We have to have our strength renewed after we have had our strength zapped. You got to be spent. You got to be wiped out. You have to do something for the, you have to be a servant of the most high God. And we can't tell God how we going to serve. We can't tell God if we're going to really sacrifice for him, if we're really going to serve him, if we really want him to say, well done, we love it. Lord going to say, I'm looking forward to the day that the Lord said, well done, our good and faithful servant. Let me tell you, he won't say well done unless you have done well. Will we really, really, really follow God? They're at the Red Sea. I'm talking about some Red Sea experiences. God knows the best route through which we are to take. God knows the best route. Back home, we would call it route. God knows the best route to which we are to take. God knows the best route. We, we think we have the best route, but God knows the best route. God got us on a plan, right? We can be rebellious and get off the plan. We, we, when, we first, when I first bought my um, Silverado, it had OnStar in it. OnStar had just come out. And you would put the number in there, and the OnStar would talk to you. This is before telephones got smart. OnStar would talk to you. You put your route in there, and then you exit to get gas. OnStar would tell you, you have, you have exit the planned route. And it will worry you to death until you get back on I-10. It says, you have exit the planned route. And then if you keep driving, it'll tell you, take a safe U-turn and get back on your planned route. You see, we, we, we are individuals, we are smart, we are intelligent, we, we set up our own routes. And when we set up our own routes, God is saying, wait a minute, get back on the route. I got a plan for your life. When we did do the four spiritual laws, one of the first things we tell a person, God has a wonderful plan for your life. God has a wonderful plan for your life. What we're trying to tell them is until you submit to the Lord, until you receive Jesus as your Savior, you cannot be a part of this wonderful plan that God has for your life. God has a wonderful plan. And after you say God still has a wonderful plan, it's not your plan. Because if I followed my plan, I wouldn't be standing here. I guarantee you I would. I tell you for a matter of fact that I wouldn't stand here, be standing here. The reason why I chose electronics is because I didn't want to deal with people. Now, guess what? Guess what, Brother Whitlock? Every day of my life, now I'm wondering, God, how did I get here? <laughs> I told you I didn't want to deal with it. <laughs> I figured diodes, transistors, and anodes did not talk back. <laughs> I had come to the conclusion that electrodes did not talk back. Now I got a whole lot of folk talking back. God has a wonderful plan. And since God has this plan, I'm glad God is working out his plan in me. Because my plan was going to lead me the wrong way. 
God has a plan. Let's follow God's plan. And sometimes we have to just submit, God, okay, God, it's your plan. It's in your hands. Do what you do. Do how you do it. God is in your hands. We say those things, but do we really mean it? God will create miracles from mess, from mistakes, and from misfortune. God will create miracles. We all going to have a testimony. If we don't have one yet, just keep waking up in the morning. We going to have great testimonies if we do it God's way because God creates miracles out of mess. God create miracles out of mistakes. And God create miracles out of misfortune. God does it. There's a woman that was caught up into lesbian activity for many, many years. And she has a book out now. My mess became my ministry. My mess became my ministry. So what do you think she's doing now? She's married to a man. She's singing in the choir in Austin, Texas. And she has children. And the, and the, the ending says, and they live happily ever after. And she says, my mess became my ministry. So somebody tell me, what is she doing now if her mess became a ministry? She ministering to other people who were caught up in what she was caught up in. And that's what God, God takes you five years through something so you can take ten minutes to tell somebody how to get out of what they're in. God, God creates miracles out of mess. He creates miracles out of mistakes. And he creates miracles out of misfortune. God does it. He's an awesome God. I just want to tell you, if you don't hear anything else, the God we serve is the awesome God. He is, he is awesome. My final point, the conclusion of the matter. God wants to get the glory from our lives. I said God wants to get the glory from our lives. Even at Red Sea. Even with the enemy, even with the deserts, in the midst of all we're going through, God wants to get the glory out of our lives. Will you allow him to have the glory? Will you honor him? Will you sacrifice for him? Will you, will you be more concerned about God's glory than what you want? Because this is how God works. When you become more concerned about him getting the glory than you being relieved of your circumstances, then God blesses you real good a heap in a plenty. When you focus more on God getting the glory, God use my life, use my heart, use my mind that you will get the glory. When you focus on God receiving the glory more than God releasing you from your Red Sea experience, then God will bless you. And I'm telling you, he will bless you a whole heap and a whole plenty. See, it's our focus. It's our motives. We got to stay focused on what God is taking us through. So most of this, uh, Robert Morgan didn't say I said it, but the fact of the matter is, it's our focus. It's our motives. God wants the glory. And you got to tell God, before you buy a car, God, how can you get the glory out of this? Before you buy a house in a certain neighborhood, God, would you get the glory out of this? Certainly before you marry somebody, Cord Woods. God, how can you get glory? Not how can I be happy. How can you get glory? God, glorify yourself in me. That's what Jesus said. God, glorify yourself in me. And because Jesus was so concerned about God getting the glory, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. Died, buried, rose again. And every step of the way, God got the glory. Even when the enemy thought that he had Jesus, God was still getting the glory. In his death, God got the glory. Jesus stopped dying long enough to forgive them. Jesus stopped dying long enough to welcome a guy into paradise. 
God was still getting the glory. Jesus died. He was buried in a brand new sepulchre where no man had ever laid. He laid there, stayed there. But early that third day morning, he sure enough got glory because he rose with all power. Will you be concerned about God getting the glory? Will you be more concerned about God getting the glory than about you being fulfilled in what you want? Because when you focus on God, receiving the glory, and you apply yourself, and you nourish what God has blessed you with, we are so blessed. We're just so blessed. We have to give our talents to him, give our treasures to him, and we can't be fighting about it. Can't be arguing with God about it. We can't be like the little boy that came around. His mom had given him a dollar. He had a whole dollar. And he got to the basket and he started pulling that dollar back. She tried to put it in. He pulled it back. She tried to put it in. She pulled it back. And that's how we do with our treasure, our talent. That's what we do. But we got to make sure that God gets the glory. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Lord, that you can get the glory in our lives. Bless us as we go, Father God, that we will go unhampered, unhindered, that we will keep our focus on you. We will remember our purpose is to, to give you glory and that we will obey your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. For those of you who are not saved, not born again, this is your moment. You can receive Jesus right now as you are. The door of the church is open. You can just trust Jesus. Invite him into your life by believing the story that we just talked about. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you want to join us in heaven, just bow your head with me and invite him into your life. Say these words, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe now that you're born again, you're saved, and you're on your way to heaven. Go and join yourself with a good Bible teaching church where Jesus is the reason for the preaching. Jesus is the reason for the singing. And then get busy working for the Lord, sacrificing for him, doing things for him. And watch what God does. He takes and makes miracles out of mess. He makes miracles out of misfortunes. The God we serve make miracles out of all our mistakes. Trust him and he will make a world of a difference. It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering and sacrificial gifts. It is offering time. This is a moment where we can give electronically. If you want to give electronically to the New Beginning Church, um, you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your gift to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77. Four five nine. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give. We ask you to bless every giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Thank you for joining us here at the New Beginning Church. We're located at 4251 Shiremai Road, Houston, Texas. We have church service at 1030 a.m. every Sunday. We have 9 o'clock Sunday school every Sunday, 9 a.m. Sunday school every Sunday. And then you can join us again for Bible study every Wednesday at 7.15 p.m. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.